Our next speaker is uh, Mike Brunt, and he will complete the fundamentals, part two. Thank you. Thanks. This is forward. Yep. Thanks. Thanks very much. Um, I'd like to um, just acknowledge uh, Steve Schweitzberg and and Dan Jones for their vision for this uh, Fuse uh, pro uh, program, and uh, and also the hard work of Pascal and Leanne to bring this uh, program together with you. These are my uh, disclosures. So um, I'll uh, uh, con confess to you that I uh, don't consider myself ele an electrosurgical expert like Dr. Uh, Monroe, even though I've been using electrosurgical energy for a long time. Uh, and so I'm going to approach this from a little bit uh, more of the um, safety and precautions uh, standpoint. And um, these are just a few facts that help, I think, illustrate the importance of this uh, in the operating room. Now, most of us would consider ourselves, we know how to use these devices, but look at these numbers. And this was from a few years ago, but I, th I think this, these data still apply today. AORN estimates 40,000 patients burned by uh, faulty electrosurgical devices every year. Um, up to 70% of those may be undetected at the time of injury. Uh, look at the survey of surgeons who'd ex either experienced a, a insulation failure uh, or knew somebody who had had a stray electrical burn and a tremendous amount of money paid out in claims related to electrical surgical uh, energy. And if you want to avoid staying out of the courtroom or being able to defend yourself if something happens, I think it behooves you to know a little bit more about this area. And, and certainly this is a uh, reinforced by the uh, unfortunate the death of Congress, Congressman Murtha a little bit over a year ago, which was an electrical surgical injury to the colon that uh, caused his demise. So I'd like to go through an, a number of adverse events. We'll talk a little bit about mechanisms of thermal injury, uh, strategies to reduce that risk, and then I'll finish up uh, with some uh, uh, content on smoke and uh, surgical fires. So. <clears throat> These are the various mechanisms by which electrosurgical uh, injuries can occur, and I'm going to go through each uh, one of these in a little bit of detail. So let's first talk a little bit about the electrical surgical unit. Uh, you're all familiar with it. You know what it looks like, but uh, there may be some of the things that you are not aware of in terms of safety. Um, don't put any fluids on top of the unit. How many times have you seen that happen in the operating room? You don't want to use it in the presence of flammable material. Most of us are using alcohol-based preps now. You've got to be extremely careful about that. The patient shouldn't be in contact with uh, metal objects, and they should be on an ins insulated uh, table. Um, as uh, Dr. Monroe has described, you want to use the lowest power setting uh, possible. And one thing that I, uh, often doesn't happen in my operating room, but I think is very important, you'll say, you know, change the setting to your 20, change it, increase to 30 or to 40 on the COAG mode. And you go ahead and keep working, but you don't hear anything back. I think it's just like in the aviation um, and in the cockpit, you say something, the nurse should communicate that back to you, and you say thank you so that everybody knows that you've made those settings. The other thing that's really important is to have the uh, activation and indicator alarms loud enough so everyone can see, that can hear it. Uh, I like to play music in the operating room, so we have to kind of have a balance there that we can make sure that we can hear this. But you don't want somebody stepping on the foot pedal or leaning on the, uh, on the, uh, the tip of the, uh, the, end, the pencil uh, and have it activated for a period of time before you realize that it's going off. Uh, Dr. Monroe's talked a little bit about the dispersive electrode physics, and I'm just using this as a segue into talking about that dispersive electrode and some of the precautions related to it. But you have, at the active electrode site, you have a small contact area and therefore high current density, which creates the thermal effect. But the dispersive air electrode has a large surface area uh, that should result in a low current density at any given site. And so uh, when you're thinking about this dispersive uh, electrode, and please forgive me, Malcolm, but the you know, ground pad, as most people still call it in the operating room, this contact needs to be uniform over a large surface area, and there are a number of things that you need uh, to avoid. Uh, like putting it over a bony surface or a really hairy area, or if the patient has had a uh, hip prosthesis, a metal implant or anything like that, you don't want to put it on that side. You never want to cut this down. Uh, there needs to be uniform contact over this uh, surface area. If for whatever reason it's not in the right spot, you have to move it. Uh, you shouldn't just reapply it. You should get a new pad and replace it. And uh, 
generally, I think the best strategy is to let the nurses do it because they know what they're uh, doing uh, with this. Now, one of the things that I was not aware of is this uh, split return pad, which is the way most of this technology is uh, developed now. And so basically what this allows is that the impedance is monitored by the, the ES unit uh, in each of the two pads that comprise this split electrode. And so if there is partial detachment on even one side, which might increase the risk of uh, an injury at that site to the patient, then the entire unit will uh, shut off. So it, it protects the pad if the conductivity is not uniform across that whole area. Insulation failure is another um, uh, common reason for electrosurgical energy, particularly during laparoscopic procedures. And uh, the thing to realize is that the smaller the break, then the higher the current density at that site. So that power really gets focused over a very small area. And a lot of these tiny breaks are not visible without very careful inspection. And so that's why I think it's important that you have in your hospital some type of active electrode monitoring system to detect these insulation breaks. And I know that at our institution, uh, the, um, the uh, uh, industry groups that uh, provide our uh, instruments that are used in the operating room on our laparoscopic cases are checking these on a periodic basis with a specific type of monitoring equipment. Direct coupling um, is uh, something that we do uh, intentionally. It occurs when uh, one conductive source touches or arcs to another, commonly used when you touch the, the uh, electrical surgical monopolar tip to the to forceps or to some other instrument. But just realize that this can also uh, be directed towards non-target tissue. Um, and uh, the instrument in contact might sometimes not completely be uh, in view and could be contacting other tissue. And the other thing is the surgeon can be at increased risk of, uh, for injury as well. Uh, this tip is uh, being used properly, but sometimes uh, you'll have a, your resonance or you want to touch it at the top of the forceps, which means that current's going down that instrument right through your hand and may increase the risk of uh, a burn to you. Now, I'm going to uh, tell you about a case that this actually happened to me. This was many years ago. Um, and um, despite all, and this, this case has stayed with me um, ever since uh, uh, this happened. This is a 35-year-old woman who is undergoing a lap coli. And at the end of the case, um, uh, while we were taking the gallbladder out through the umbilicus, the, uh, uh, the foot pedal was stepped on by the medical student. And we heard the alarm, and we said, get off, get off. He didn't realize what was happening. So it was probably on for a good seven to eight seconds uh, in which it was activated. Um, and um, I'll show you a picture of what the, where the uh, monopolar instrument was sitting. Um, but we went ahead and finished the case, and then I got a call back after the drapes were taken off that the patient had a burn on her nose. Um, and there was a, evidence of a burn in the overlying drape at that site. And so how did that happen? Well, um, I think this is what happened as best as we can reconstruct it. You can see there's a monopolar uh, L-hook device that's sitting there that's connected. There was another uh, grasping type instrument sitting in the pocket, had a metal post that came out the end of that. And the, the only way we can explain this is that there was conduction through the um, monopolar cautery, uh, the um, handheld L-hook device through that instrument back up uh, that returned to the patient's uh, face. So uh, a few precautions uh, that I've always done as a result of this. First of all, when I'm finished with the device at the end of the case, I usually unplug it so that nobody accidentally steps on it and activates it and make sure that I don't keep other instruments up there that could potentially um, uh, conduct uh, to the back to the patient. <clears throat> You've heard a lot about capacitive coupling, particularly in laparoscopic surgery. I've personally never seen an injury uh, that's occurred through this mechanism that I'm aware of, but certainly it's described out there. And this is uh, defined as uh, a, a stored electrical charge that occurs when two conductors are separated by an insulator. So if you have your L-hook uh, monopolar instrument, uh, you've got that uh, metal that goes through. It's insulated goes through a metal cannula, that's a situation in which you can have a capacitive coupling uh, type of current. And so basically that circuit's completed uh, through the dielectric that is the uh, insulator. And that charge gets stored in that capacitor either until the generator's deactivated or, or the pathway to complete it is completed. And I understand that actually in the era before we had the 
TV cameras that we hooked to the end of the laparoscope that sometimes GYN surgeons would get burns around their eye from a capacitive coupling type injury when they were looking directly through the laparoscope. There's a formula that's in the handout. I'm not going to go through that uh, today, but there are just a few factors you need to be aware of that potentially increase this, re this risk when you're using high voltage, that is the coag waveform. Uh, the ratio of electrode to the laparoscopic cannula, so it's greater risk with smaller cannulas, and open activation of the system. So what we mean by that is that you activate the electrosurgical unit, but you're not in contact with the tissue. How many times have uh, you been in the operating room with a resident, and they have the, uh, the L-hook monopolar device, and they're going toward the gallbladder, but they're several centimeters away, and they step on the foot pedal, and it's five or six or seven or eight seconds before you get there. That's a situation in which you build up that capacitive coupling charge. And so uh, the strategy is touch the tissue, you can back off slightly, activate so that you don't uh, do that, okay? It can also occur if you're activating over previously uh, desiccated tissue due to the high resistance to current flow. Uh, here are some of the other examples. You should never wrap the cable around uh, an instrument. Uh, if you have a wet, insulated instrument, uh, and particularly some of the old metal cannulas, they had plastic grips. I don't think those are used much anymore, but that's a potentially dangerous situation for this type of injury. Alternate site injuries. Now, <clears throat> you've already learned that the current mu uh, delivered must uh, return to a generator, but it can e exit at any conductive uh, object. This is much less common today because of these isolated generators. So basically, they are constructed uh, so that they will not deliver more current to the active electrode if there are not enough current returns to the generator. That is, it's leaving through some other uh, site. But nonetheless, we should still take uh, precautions, uh, particularly the patient shouldn't be in any contact with any objects that have a lot high conductivity. This is usually not so much a problem in the patient's supine, but I mean, look at this patient up on their side for a lap adrenal. They've got this. Uh, this uh, metal post there that their arm is next to, and you have to really uh, make sure that you've inspected that and that they're uh, protected from that kind of thing. Inadvertent activation is another mechanism for injury, um, and you have to really be aware of creating uh, an injury out of the field of view. Think about doing a lap coli. Uh, you've kind of lost your position with your, uh, your, with your foot on the activation uh, device. Uh, you look away, your uh, monopolar instrument is inside the patient, uh, and it wanders, you're not sure where it is, and that tip may be right next to the bow. Uh, it would be very easy to accidentally step on that and to potentially uh, create an injury that you're not even aware of until the patient comes back a couple of days later uh, with a bowel perforation and sepsis. Direct thermal extension, uh, we deal with adhesions. You have to be very careful of that. I'm using the example of lap coli, uh, but oftentimes we'll see adhesions between the duodenum and the gallbladder. You have to be very careful of prolonged activations here. It can transfer thermal energy to the duodenum, uh, especially if there's a narrow attachment of the duodenum. And so it's very important to use very short activations uh, of your device. And, of course, we all realize that thermal injury is uh, still a major component of biliary injuries, uh, which occur in uh, 0.2 to 4% of uh, lap coles uh, with still a an annual estimated instance of about 3,000 bile duct injuries in the U.S. Uh, each year, and many of these involve a com component of energy. What about risk to the surgeon? Uh, most of us double glove, reduces the risk, but just realize holes are not uncommonly present in your gloves. Um, and, um, and after use, as many as 50% of cases, if you're sweating inside your glove, you can um, get an injury. Can you click on the uh, video there? And I'm sure all of you... If you can click on that, that should play. All of you have experienced something like, uh, like this, where you're working and all of a sudden, okay. So uh, I actually had a number of these when we used this old uh, monopolar device that had the metal tip out the end, and I made them get rid of that. I had burned myself a few times, and now we have a, an insulated uh, cover out there at the end. Um, and, um, well, now, let me turn to electrosurgery and smoke. So I, I think the most obvious adverse effect of this is it just interferes uh, with our visualization in laparoscopic surgery. This is electrosurgical plume. We get it with ultrasonic devices and a variety of other things. 
But you may not be as aware of some of the byproducts that occur uh, from smoke. I think we need to be, uh, pay more attention to this. Um, the uh, smoke plume from electrosurgery is similar to laser plume. There are a lot of nasty byproducts that occur. They're all listed here. Um, and they include even potentially mutagenic or carcinogenic materials, uh, bioaerosols, including blood fragments, viral particles, carboxyhemoglobin, methemoglobin. And just realize that your surgical masks are not adequate for filtering these things uh, out. Uh, most of these smoke particles are smaller uh, than the filter size on your mask. Um, there have been no documented cases of cancer from OR exposure to smoke, but uh, a number of reports of ocular and upper respiratory irritation in healthcare personnel. And OSHA has recommended that smoke evacuation systems be used uh, uh, in routinely in the operating room. This is not a mandate, but it is a, a recommendation. Um, and I think we should uh, use these more frequently than we do. Uh, there can be central smoke evac units, portable. Uh, it can be a wall suction with inline filter, uh, and particularly in their specific laparoscopic evacuation and filter filtration systems that can be used as well. And I think eventually what's going to happen is this probably will be mandated anytime we're using any kind of electric surgical a device that's going to generate any smoke. And this is just uh, a reference if you want to learn more about this. Uh, this is, should be in your uh, syllabus. Uh, explosions, uh, fortunately, are extremely rare, but they did happen in the era when ether and cyclopropane were used in the operating room. Um, electrosurgery risk with unprepped bowel should be extremely low, but it's one reason why you don't use mannitol for bowel preps uh, anymore because of the increased risk of methane. Also may be used to, uh, increased a little bit with nitrous oxide, which is fortunately not used as much in the operating room anymore as well. But surgical fires do occur, and uh, obviously they can be devastating. Um, interestingly, I didn't realize this, but there are anywhere from 550 to 650 cases per year of fires in the operating room. That's similar to the number of wrong site surgery cases. Admittedly, most of these are minor, don't result in any significant injury, but 20 to 30 serious injuries potentially disfiguring or disabling, and that is way too many. Uh, these are some uh, uh, references on this. This has been a joint commission uh, uh, priority and is one of 11 priority safety topics identified by the ARN Presidential Commission on Patient Safety. You wouldn't think surgical fires is a big enough of a problem, uh, but it potentially can be. Basically, to have a fire in the operating room, you need three things. Uh, you need a heat source, which, of course, is our ESU units or laser. You need fuel, which there's plenty of that between the drapes and the prep. And you need an oxidizer, that is oxygen or nitrous oxide. And again, there's plenty of that around as well. And so prevention uh, really prevents, uh, consists of coordination by the various uh, providers. I'm sorry, let me go back. Um, uh, about 20% of these occur in the airway. A lot of these are in the head, neck, face, or upper chest combination of oxygen in that area, plus an ignition source. Most of these are due to electrosurgical uh, equipment. This is a uh, guideline on um, how to prevent uh, uh, fires in the operating room. It's from the ECRI Institute, and you can go online and, and uh, easily uh, look this up. Um, <clears throat> again, there are a number of oxidizers that are present in the operating room. And one of the things which I did not realize, but in getting ready for this talk, uh, one of the ways to avoid this is to minimize the use of open oxygen. That is, oxygen administered via mask or cannula. And you have to be especially careful for head and neck procedures. I do some mentally invasive parathyroidectomies under local anesthesia. Oftentimes the patient has a mask or a cannula. You've got to be extremely careful about how you use the electrosurgery in that setting. And, uh, and also doing a tracheostomy. You really should not use uh, electrosurgery uh, to enter uh, the trachea uh, because of the high concentration of oxygen that's uh, present there. Um, beware that you can have oxygen enrichment under the surgical drapes. You shouldn't put the drapes on until the flammable preps have dried and make sure you soak up anything. Oftentimes, we're anxious to get things going. The prep is on, but you just got to take a few seconds, wait, let it dry a little bit before you put the drapes on, and then um, always connect the fiber optic light cable on the laparoscopic equipment before you activate the source. It should be on standby because that tip can get uh, very hot and can easily cause a fire. So beware of open to use. That's probably something we should integrate into our team, uh, in our, to our timeout and discussion. 
Activate your uh, unit only when you can see the tip. Um, uh, make sure you place your electrosurgical device in the holster when it's not in use. Uh, I certainly have an issue with this in the operating room and constantly reminding people, don't put the electrosurgical pencil up on the patient's chest or up on their face. It happens a lot. You've got to be vigilant about that. And we've got to really enforce those principles in our residents very, from the very beginning of uh, training. You should never put rubber sleeves on your electrosurgical units because they uh, can melt. What If you're ever in that situation where you have a fire, what should you do? Um, stop the flow of all airway gases to the patient, okay? So basically, anesthesia should immediately disconnect the breathing circuit. Now, if it's an airway fire, which hopefully in our profession we would never see, uh, but can occur certainly with oral surgery, is the, the entire breathing circuit needs to be removed. You take the endotracheal tube out. More practical for us, uh, because most of these are going to be the abdomen chest area, the first step is to remove all of the burning and burn materials from the patient, whether it's on or in the patient. Get it out of there, because even after the fire's out, the heat can continue to cause injury. Um, then you can get the, put the fire out on the burning materials. It's rare that you'd ever need to use a fire extinguisher for that, and then uh, take care of the patient. This is a, in case of an extreme a smoke, a fire, a hazard. There's this race, a mnemonic, rescue, alert, confine, evacuate, um, and uh, hopefully none of us will ever have to employ this mnemonic in any of our patients. If you want to uh, read a little bit more about this, which I would encourage you to do, there are a number of references that are listed in your syllabus. Thank you very much.